at night and they shutting uh, okay. you know, later in the day okay. yeah no there okay. was nothing today at all for us okay okay i will i will just convey this message okay no that's fine oh there comes kim kim's joining us uh are you still you'll have to let uh, kim in and let kim be i can't do anything at the moment there we go okay. thank you <laughs> hi, hi kim Sue. Lovely Good to have morning. you in class. Good oh, morning. I'm delighted to see you. I didn't know if we were having anybody today because there were no messages for us. So we thought Ooh. we were on our own today. Uh, there's nothing for us on Slack to tell us if we're having TAs or live streaming or anything like that. So uh, it's okay. very nice to, to see you and to have Harry in as well. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Right, let me take okay. So, thank I will you. Be you guys have a great day. I will meet you in your next class. Then, fantastic. Bye -bye. Thanks, Harry. Bye. Yeah, so how are you today, Kim? Hi, I'm good. So, is this your first class today? Yes, it is. It's my first one this morning. Mm -hmm. um, Re regarding um, the Slack, I've sent you a message, but it's just 10 minutes before the... Yes, I but... saw your I saw your message coming through. <laughs> yeah, I, was so I was already thinking, talking to how Harry. How about the email? How about an email? So have yeah. you received one so that I can no, uh, tell no, the team about it? No, oh, okay. let me see. I'm going into my emails now. I always get it on Slack. Um, mm. uh, no, no. No, no, there's no. nothing. No, nothing. Okay, I'll I'll have this notated. Okay, for our uh, check, because usually okay. there should be like, you know, an information about yeah, who it your comes day in, is. It, yeah, it comes in usually. For, I I only go to bed after at midnight or after, and it's usually in by that time, um, because obviously American time is not so late. Uh, <laughs> but today there's there's nothing on Slack at all for us, Ooh, so we okay. are. We are all on our own today. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> they, they're obviously busy somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll, I'll check that one. Because <laughs> it's uh, good to be, you know, given the information, your tears, the attendance and all that. So, yeah, yeah free to monitor it. I'll, I'll have that checked. Thank you so much. That's You're excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Australian wildlife. Oh, it's a different class today. Yeah. Oh, haven't you had this one? Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, this is my first time with this class because usually oh. it's arts and crafts. Yeah. And yeah. micro greens with, with Michael. That's, that's Michael's micro greens. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, this, this one is the second one in the series of Australian animals. In the first one, I do the main ones that everybody knows, koalas and kangaroos and um, the, the big, the bigger ones that, that everybody's aware of. And all and most of the marsupials, I, because Australia has more marsupials than any other country in the world. That means it's a babe, they put their babies in a pouch. When the baby's born, it's only that size and it lives in a pouch until it's big enough to be able to go out into the big wide world. And there are so many different marsupials in Australia. Um, and so I cover, I think, nine in my first one. And I have some more in this particular one. But this one has interesting animals, ones that most people don't know anything about. So uh, okay. these are the, the smaller, more interesting, except for the crocodile. The, the rest are smaller, <laughs> more interesting in, uh, and uh, less dangerous animals in this one. So, yeah, okay. we are, are going to. Uh, thank you. So, uh, yes, so that is going to be awesome. Um, I think um, in, in theory, we have got um, the new gentleman from Australia joining us today. He may be joining us in class, which would be very nice. Um, and so uh, that could be, be interesting in class today to have. Um, different people coming into class um, mm -hmm. so we'll see uh, who's who's in class today um, oh sorry wrong one uh, let's see we've got oh we've got quite a lot of people in class today um, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, including Mark Mark Bevan is who is from Australia to, uh, to get set up. Hi, Earl. Good morning. Don't forget to click the record button. Okay? I won't. I have done that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Always useful. Oh, no, it didn't do what I wanted it to do. So let me try again. Alt C. Yeah, there we go. Now we are doing. Good morning, Earl. Lovely to have you in class. Hey, Tega. Yep, yep. Good morning to you, then. I think it's, it's even evening here, for you. But yes. yes. Where, where do you come from, Earl? Uh, we're up in Michigan. In Michigan. Ah, so yeah. what? It's like uh, nine o'clock at night, ten o'clock at night. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. So you t you're yeah. ten uh, you're twelve hours behind us. Mm -hmm. All right, and Tega, welcome, Tega. Um, so that's great. Lovely to have you um, uh, in class with us today. Uh, today is the second one in the series of Australian animals. We did the, the well-known ones and most of the marsupials in the first one. Now, today we are doing interesting little animals and big animals um, that you also find in Australia. Hi, Beta. Uh, lovely to have you in class two. Great. Um, now, oh, excellent. Hi, Hello. where do you, where are you from, Beta? Uh, it's Beata, and I'm Beata. From, ah, what I'm a beautiful from, name, Beata. I'm from Michigan in the United States. From Michigan States. too. Okay, you yeah, and two Earl. From Michigan? Yeah, Earl's from Michigan too. Yep, so, Michigan. From Marshall. I'm in the Detroit, I'm Oakland County. So oh, hello. Uh, 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 nice oh, to have. have nice I've been to waiting have. to get into one of your classes. It wasn't at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> well, next next month they are moving my classes earlier. It means I get up at six o'clock in the morning, but that's okay. So my classes, a lot of my classes will move forward and be earlier in the day. So um It'll be six o'clock in the evening for you instead of midnight. <laughs> uh, hi, Charles. Lovely to have you in class two. Excellent. We've got a super class starting today. Um, we have uh, Beverly's coming in. We have Kim with us today. She is from Get Set Up. And if you have any issues or uh, something you can't work out, just contact her on the little chat box. Also, she's there when I don't see your hands waving. I would prefer you to ask questions without um, chat, writing them in chat because I do miss them in chat. Uh, so into what I'm doing. But at the end of each animal, I do ask if there are questions. So hopefully I'll be able to answer the questions on the different animals as we go along. Right. I think we have got a few more that are due to come in. But instead of that, let me just um, begin. I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and then we're going to start with some of the lesser known animals in, um, let me just give it, turn it into a PowerPoint. There we go. All right. These are more of the, as I say, lesser known, but some of them are very well known, interesting animals. The one we've got here is the echidna. And he is has a, a fantastic history and a fantastic way of life, which you will be hearing about just now. But what we do is we learn from each other. So ideally, if we've got cameras on, we can see you, we can chat to you. But if you don't want your camera on, that's also okay. Just interact. That's great as well. If you're joining by live streaming, the only way you're going to interact is by actually registering for the class. And we're not paid to promote anything. So if I use a product or say something, it's not, it's something that I do or have. A little about me. My name is Sue Murray, as you know, and I live in Perth, Australia. 
Um, I've been an educator for 44 years and I uh, love teaching children and adults, but what I enjoy now more is working with as a Get Set Up Guide because now instead of teaching, I am imparting and sharing knowledge with you. And that for me is so nice and it's so interesting and able to communicate with people. I have enjoy creating and making things, including any kind of puzzle. Um, that is my, my favorite. And I've got a great love of animals. That's why I do African animals and Australian animals. Um, my husband is also a Get Set Up Guide. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have been in his classes as well. He doesn't have the same name as me. He's Michael Plumstead. And I'm sure some of you have been in his classes along the way. Right, so let's have a look. Today we are doing Australian Wild Animals Part 2, from the cute and cuddly to the large and somewhat scary animals that we have. So let's see what we're going to see. We go from timid, tiny little animals to really dangerous animals. Just looking at what we've got in front of us here, if we go across each of the lines, we've got an animal called a numbat, and then a cassowary, which is the third largest land-locked animal, he, uh, bird, it can't fly, to the echidna, to the little potteroo, to the emu, and the thorny devil. What looks like a wonderful, peaceful little dog is anything but a dog. He's a dingo and he is not to be toyed with. If we have time, I will put on the sound of the uh, kookaburra because it laughs. It sounds like it's laughing from the bottom of its toes and the sound comes up and we have a little forest next to us, and often that you'll have two of them in the forest, and, I, and the sound comes in through my window, and I can't help but laugh along with the kookaburra because it's such an interesting sound. We also have a very cute little animal called a quoll with its little spots on it. My favorite of all is the fairy penguin. They are adorable. They're only this size when they're fully grown and they are really such a pleasure to see. The little bilby belongs to the same family as the bandicoot, which we did in the last series, but he's somewhat special with his long ears. And last of all, our very large dangerous crocodile. So these are some of the animals we are looking at today. Right. The first one we're looking at is the bilby. The bilby is a medium-sized little animal. He's sort of bigger than a rat. Um, we have his brother or cousin that comes into our garden every day called a bandicoot and he well he's one of the bandicoot family he comes and eats the dog food every day and he's become quite friendly we talk to him and we can even walk quite close to him if we get too close then he disappears and um, he doesn't like the dogs that much because the little dog thinks he shouldn't be eating her food so he only comes when the dogs are inside um, these bilbies are beautiful. They've got long ears, so they kind of look like a rabbit. So when it's Easter time, the bilby is often used in the advertisements because we don't have rabbits in Australia. So um, we are able to uh, just have the, the little bilbies um, and they live in each picture. I've put where the different animals live. So these ones live mainly in the northern part of West Australia, basically because their habitat has been eroded. They used to be all over the place and their habitat has slowly been eroded. And so they only live in small areas now. They've existed in Australia for up to 15 million years. So they've been around an incredibly long time and they are very distinct with their tail. It's got a black 
band and it's quite a rough band in the center of the tail. So you can always tell a bilby and of course it's very long nose that it sticks out, that sticks out in front. Um, they are um, have strong claws and they dig with their claws and they dig burrows. Um, some of the other uh, bandicoots don't burrow. They find little places to sleep, but the bilby likes his burrow and he digs into his burrow. They are um, omnivores. They eat mainly vegetation, but they're not averse to eating some ants or insects along the way as well. Um, any questions about the little bilby? Okay, right. Now, the next one is an animal called the numbat. He is only eats insects. So he doesn't eat any of the vegetation. He's uh, an insect of all. And he is awake in the day and the night. He is quite happy to be around at any time. Um, but he lives on termites. His tongue is four inches long. Now that is for the size of the actual animal. Uh, four inches is my t is that long. He's got this very, very long tongue because he is only 25 centimeters himself in body without the tail. And then he's got an extra 10 um, centimeters sticking out the front of him. So he's got this very long tongue to go deep into the termite mounds and get the termites out that he requires. So he digs in, licks, and then brings out again. Um, he was right over Australia at one stage, but again, because of um, people moving into the areas, they're now in very small quantities, uh, mainly in Western Australia, down in the southern part of Western Australia. They don't need a lot of water. They get enough moisture from the termites that they eat. So they are like the koala. The koala also doesn't drink water. He gets his water from the leaves that he eats. So it's very interesting that they can do that. Um, they weigh about two kilograms and two kilograms is uh, about three pounds. And they live for about five years in the wild. They don't they live in small colonies there's just a few of them together they're not very social but they do like their little family and they live in their little families any questions about them I think I'd be a bit scared to see that tongue coming out towards me when I'm such from such a small animal uh, but they really are very cute the potteroo is a long-nosed creature. A lot of the animals in Australia have long noses. It's quite interesting to, to observe. Um, and he's actually very attractive in his funny way. He's only out at night. He's not seen during the day. So most people don't get a chance to see him unless he's in a zoo. Um, <clears throat> they are like a kangaroo. They've got, again, the Big back legs, small front legs. The bandicoot has the same. Big back legs, small front legs. So a lot of them belong to the same family as the kangaroo. They all also have their pouches. They are marsupials. Um, and so their baby is the size of a jelly bean when it's born, goes into the pouch, stays there until it is ready to come out. And then it looks just like a kangaroo. It pops its head out and then slowly moves out. Um, they don't work with others. They live on their own and only get together when they are um, ready to mate. Uh, otherwise, they live on their own. The female brings up the babies, um, but they are very much solitary animals. That's why it's so difficult to see them. You can't find a few of them and be able to find them. Uh, they're not territorial. And it's interesting, they live in the forests where there's trees at the top 
and then the low vegetation underneath, the little grasses and the little plants that grow deep at the bottom of the forest, they live in that undergrowth. They call it understory. So you live underneath that. So unless you're walking in the forests of Queensland or T Tasmania and southeastern Australia, sorry, not Queensland, um, there's a, also a forest in Queensland, but they don't live in that one. And they live on fruits and flowers, seeds and insects. So in order to see them, you really have to spend a lot of time traipsing through the undergrowth. And you may be lucky enough to see one in the wild. Any questions? Not yet, okay. Now, this for me is one of the most interesting animals that you can come across. This is the echidna. Now, in the last lesson, I talked about the platypus. And he and the echidna are the last two remaining animals that are marsupials, but, oh, sorry, not marsupials, um, uh, mammals, but lay eggs. They are marsupials of a sort, but they are mammals that lay eggs. The platypus actually lays his egg. What the echidna does is it lays its egg in its pouch. So the egg is resting in the pouch, and after about 10 days, the egg um, hatches, and the little baby is already safely in the pouch and then starts to grow. Again, when they're born, size of a jelly bean. And then they grow. They, when they're born, they have like a soft downy fur. They don't have the, the sharp prickles of the adult, which is just as well, because I think mom would be very uncomfortable if she had pricks pricking into her stomach all the time. And these little prickles between them, there are lots of downy hairs, which keeps them warm. And then slowly their prickles start to grow. As, as ugly as they are, I think they're so cute. They also have this very long tongue that can go in and out. Some people call them a spiny anteater. And uh, they live uh, in quite different places of Australia, all around Australia in different places. Um, they're mating is I think probably the most interesting of all. They, the male has four penises and the lady has two vaginas. And so he has to mate with two. But the mating ritual that goes on is about a month before the lady is ready, as many echidnas, male echidnas, as would like to mate with her, form a long chain. And they go nose to tail and they follow her everywhere she goes. And sometimes one will fall out and he's got to join the back of the queue again. And off they go. They walk and walk and walk. When she's ready, they dig a hole around her. They dig, a, dig a, like a little trench around her. All the males jump into the trench and then they fight to kick each other out of the trench. And the last one left in the trench, he's the one who wins the prize. If you've been kicked out of the trench, you can't climb back in. And so that's how they do it. And then they will go and mate. So it's a very interesting way of doing things. Um, the a little echidna is about 35 to um, 60 centimeters long, about just over a ruler and a little bit longer at their full, full growth. And they weigh about um, between one and three kilos. So they're not a heavy animal. Their best way to protect themselves is to roll in a ball. And anything that wants to attack them will play with them like a ball until they get bored. And then they'll go away and the echidna is quite safe and out it comes. It walks slowly and it lives a slow life. It actually can live up to 50 years in captivity and 45 years out in the wild. So it really has a lovely time. Um, they are able to, the baby echidna is called a puggle. And I think that's such a cute name for such, <laughs> it is ugly, but it's beautiful little animal. Any questions or uh, thing you would like to ask about them? Sue, 
Right. Mm. So this is actually a little more like a hedgehog because they don't throw their their spines. Mm -mm. No. No, they, they are just off. like a hedgehog. Yes, they're just like a hedgehog. They tuck themselves in and uh, they don't throw their spines. Their spines don't come out. So, yes, you're quite right. They are just like a hedgehog in that way. It's just their different way of doing things. Um, and I think a hedgehog baby is a bit prettier than this little puggle that we have here. But and they, they, they're just the sweetest little creatures again as you see long noses a lot of the animals in australia have these long noses but right. if we were to touch the spines we, we would we could prick ourselves pretty badly you, they're sharp you, you could with the with an adult you would prick yourself i i would put on gloves if i was going to hold hold them uh, obviously some people have ways of doing of holding it uh, safely maybe they know how to but the baby of course you can hold because the spines are soft and then it's easy to hold but yeah they uh, if you picked up a, an echidna uh, it's, it's a heavy animal well 3 kilos is enough to be able to pick up they would be in a ball um, unless they knew you. Obviously, if they're in a, a sanctuary and they know the people, they probably would allow themselves to be picked up open, but not otherwise. I see. Any, uh, yes, Tega. Do they, do they spend it like uh, porcupines? They're not like a porcupine because they don't throw their quills. They, they're more like a hedgehog. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, now, this is the little qual. He's also a marsupial. And he's got, again, a long snout with a very pink nose. And of the spots are very distinct on his back. You get dark ones and light ones. Um, and he lives inside things. So he'll live in a log or inside a tree. Um, he lives on his own, only getting together, again, for, for mating. Um, he's got long a long body and uh, black and can be black or brown or even a very pale brown but definitely got the white spots on him he's also about the length of a ruler and weighs between one and three kilograms so again about four pounds four five pounds so also small interesting little animal very reclusive, does not like people at all. He hunts and forages on his own uh, and only interacts during mating time. Uh, they are mainly carnivorous, so they, but they also can eat fruit and the occasional vegetable matter. They'll rather eat a mouse or um, insects, ants, um, not so much the ants though, but more insects, uh, little mice, um, baby, baby animals that they come across, they will then eat those. So they are one of the carnivores. There are very few carnivorous marsupials. The um, Tasmanian devil is one of them. The qual is another one um, that is ma mainly carnivorous. Um, any questions about this little interesting one? He's, he's tiny, beautiful, very different, and not seen very often. Now, the dingo. Oh, they look like lovely dogs. Oh, I like dogs. I'll go and give the dingo a pat. No, you won't. Um, a dingo is very like a wolf. You would not walk up to the local wolf and say, hi, wolf. And in the same way, you don't go up to a dingo. Uh, a dingo is a wild dog. And anything that is wild, you give a wide berth to because it's a wild animal. And they hunt in packs. And you know that if you're fighting one thing, you can handle it. If you're fighting 10, you don't stand a chance. They they are, have been known to attack humans, but not very often. Uh, they would rather attack other animals they, to eat. They eat fish. They like fishing. Uh, they live anywhere. They live in the desert. They live in the forest. They live basically anywhere. 
They have a den underground where all the babies are born and they like to live with their, they live in a pack, usually about 10 people or members of the pack, they're not people, they're animals, and they travel together and hunt together. Uh, but rank is very important. Whoever's top dog, that person has the say. And if anybody thinks they can beat top dog, they will fight top dog. If they lose, then they're out. If they don't, they take over and top dog falls down out of grace and is no longer. There's a dominant female and her mate, and they lead the pack. But the ultimate leader is the male in this case. Remember, many other animals, the female is the leader, like the elephant and so on. But this time, the male is the leader. They make their dens in rabbit holes, caves, hollow logs, and they are very social. Um, and they, although some one or two, a few dingoes live on their own, but they really don't look as dangerous as they are. But you do need to be careful of a dingo. Any questions? No questions on the dingo. Right now, this is one I only like when it's this size and I can actually see every part of it in one go. Uh, this is our crocodile. Now, the crocodiles are um, mainly found in the northern area of Australia, in Queensland, um, a little bit of, in uh, Western Australia where I live, and between Western Australia and Queensland in, hmm, can't remember what it's called now. I've only been in Australia three years and I'm still kidding myself around Australia. Um, I'll think of it in a moment. Maybe Mark can help me. Mark, can you tell me which territory it is? I uh, just wondered if it might be Northern Territory. So Yes, you're right. Northern Territory it is. Yeah, as soon as you said it, I knew. Uh, thank you, Mark. Mark lives in Australia, so I was hoping he could help me. All right, welcome, Mark. Uh, right, the one thing that we have to be careful about a crocodile, they can hide. By If you look at the bottom picture, the bottom uh, right-hand picture, that crocodile lying on that branch you really can't see him at first glance. So you could lean against a branch and be breakfast for a crocodile if you are in crocodile territory. So you do have to be careful of your crocodiles. Um, as not so long ago on the news, there was a crocodile that wanted to cross from one side of the river to the other side, and he took the bridge. So they had to close off half the bridge while they waited for the crocodile to walk across the bridge and come off at the other side where he wanted to be. Nobody was prepared to uh, go close enough to him, so they just closed the road while he walked. Interesting thing about crocodiles, they cannot chew. They've got a very strong jaw, but they can't chew. Their, their jaw doesn't go from side to side. So they swallow whatever they eat whole. Then they swallow stones and the stones grind up what they have eaten. So if you uh, happen to open a crocodile, you might find a whole something inside it that hasn't yet been digested. So they are unable to chew, but those large jaws can certainly cause a huge amount of damage if they should bite. Uh, baby crocodiles, uh, it's so interesting with them. They, um, have, they lay their eggs and it depends on the temperature at the time of egg laying. If the temperature is above 32 degrees Celsius, um, which would probably be about 80 degrees Fahrenheit for you, then they will all be males. But if, they, if the temperature is lower, they are all females. So usually you'll get a whole batch of eggs that are only male or female, unless the female has taken time to lay and the temperature has dropped during that time, then you might get a mixture of male and females. Um, and so they, they live for 30 to 40 years, and it takes about three months for the eggs to hatch. Um, the crocodiles don't take much notice of them. They 
put them where they know it's going to be warm and basically leave them alone. Uh, they then return to the water or, or the land, depending on what they are doing. The two species we find in Australia, the freshwater crocodile is not found anywhere else in the world, while the Asturian crocodile is found in other countries as well. That's the one where it's fresh and seawater combination, those ones you find around the world, but the freshwater one is only found here in Australia. I must say Australia has so many animals that are only found here. It is quite amazing. Um, they are just, they are so special with what they are doing. Any questions? Well, there's Hi. a question on the chat. Okay, um, let's have a look. Thank you, Kim. Um, okay. The animals are endangered. Some yes. of them are endangered. Um, the quoll is endangered. Um, the uh, bilby to a point because of its land being, um, its, its area being made so much smaller, if it gets any smaller, it will be very much endangered. Um, the echidna is not endangered yet. The potteroo, there aren't that many, so they, they it's sort of semi-endangered. Um, but uh, the, that's, they're not too endangered here. One of the things about Australia that is so amazing is that the animals are, come first in the country. Um, we have signs going across the road that say, caution, bandicoot crossing. And if there's a bandicoot crossing, you stop the bandicoot crosses and then you go. Um, it's, it's an amazing country. We live amongst the kangaroo. Uh, 500 meters from my home, there are kangaroos living quite happily. I live in a suburb. Um, uh, outside the one ho hospital, just up from where I live, the kangaroo feed outside the hospital every day. So the people, as they're getting well, can watch the wildlife. So it's an amazing country where we live in harmony with the animals. It's one of the first countries I've ever come across that that is the case. And I think it's amazing. Right, let's, oh, where's my things gone? There we go. Now. This is an interesting little character called a thorny devil. He is found in the deserts. He's not very big. He's only um, 20 centimeters, eight inches, not very long. And he's got these little spiny thorns on him. But he's very clever. He's got a lump on his head that looks like a second head. So if any thing is looking to eat him, it attacks the second head first. And, the, and that doesn't help at all because it's not really him. And he's then able to um, defend himself because he's he wasn't attacked, only the head on top of him was. Um, and he lives, he doesn't have to drink water as such. Anything he rubs up against or if it does rain at all, the water runs down the little spines and they're little channels that take the water to his mouth. So all the little channels join up and the water that lands on his body ends up in his mouth. So I think that is such a clever adaption for where he lives. Um, and so he he's able to, to have all the different things. <laughs> Um, he he has um, he also eats black ants. He eats about a thousand ants every meal. That's a lot of ants to eat. A thousand ants every meal. And what he does is his tongue is sticky, and he puts his tongue into an ant hill, takes it out very quickly, and the ants are stuck to his tongue, and he swallows them. And he does this up to 90 times every meal. Tongue in, wind around, out and in. So that's how he manages to consume so many uh, um, in, um, ants at the same time. 
and uh, he can change color. He's a little like a chameleon to fit and blend in with wherever he is. So if he's on the red sand, he's a reddy color. If he's on a brown branch, he'll turn a brown color. And it's very clever. He even can go oranges as well and even a little green at times. So he's able to change his color according to where he is. Any questions? Okay, right. Now, this is the most dangerous land animal in the world. It's not the biggest, but it's the most dangerous. The Southern Cassowary. This dates back to the time of the dinosaurs. He's got a very big piece of cartilage on his head. And he's got this blue, blue head with these big eyes and the red wattle neck. You can't miss him. It's not his head that is dangerous. It's those feet with the very long claws. If those feet kick you and hit you, they can go deep into the skin and actually rupture a, a vein or an artery. So they are very, very dangerous. The babies are a little brown color. They are insignificant. They look like uh, they fit in with the undergrowth very nicely. And they are only found in the northeastern Queensland rainforests. They're very important for the rainforests because they distribute the seeds. They eat and then move with the seeds and deposit them further over. And so it keeps the ecosystem going in the Queensland forests. If they weren't there, the forests would be in, in danger. They um, are of, um, flightless. And as I said before, they come from the dinosaur. When I saw my first cassowary, I, I, I thought that somebody was playing a joke that somebody painted some colors on this bird because it really is the strangest looking bird in the world. Any questions? Right. Now, the second, now the cassowary is the third largest animal, uh, land bird. The first one is found in Africa. It's the ostrich. The second one is the emu. And the emu is even on our coat of arms. So it is a very important bird in the history of the country. And a lot of stories that come from the Aborigines have the uh, uh, emu in their stories. Um, it's the, the, the male is the one who incubates the eggs, not the female for a change. It's kind of like the, the penguins do the same. The male does the incubation. And that male sits on those eggs for up to eight weeks. He doesn't eat. He doesn't drink during that time. He gets very thin and mangy. And every day he turns the eggs 10 times. When the eggs are laid, they are a very light green. And as they are being incubated, they turn a darker and darker green until they look like jade. And when they are ready, then they hatch. After that, the mom comes back. The, mad, the dad can now go and eat and mom will help to look after the little ones. Dad will return, but um, the, the, the coloring, his job is to look after the eggs while they are still eggs. They are very fast runners. They are high jumpers and very strong swimmers. So they can get around very easy. The only thing they can't do is fly. Uh, they've got three strong toes on each foot and a strong calf muscle on the back. So that allows them to run so fast and kick hard. So that they're the only animal that, I mean, bird that has a calf muscle. Um, they can run at 50 kilometers an hour, and that's fast. Um, and then they are able to take large strides, three meter long strides. So it's the same as the, um, no, the kangaroo is nine meters. Three meters is um, three small children end to end is three meters or three very long strides of ours would then make it 
one leap of theirs. So their stretch when they are running is huge. Um, the one interesting thing about an emu, he can't walk backwards. All other birds can go backwards, but he can't. So if he misses something, he's got to do a U-turn and then go back and eat what he's missed along the way. So it's very interesting that they can't back away from danger. They have to turn around and run away from danger. Anything else can back a bit and then turn, but not an emu. He only walks forwards. Any questions? Right. Now, this is the last of the animals, and he is the most beautiful of all animals, as far as I'm concerned, that we have here. The first time I saw them, because they are on a, a, a round Perth where I stay, they the first time I saw them, I thought, oh, look at all the little babies. Where are the, ba the mums and dads? And the lady informed me that, no, those are the mums and dads. There are the babies over there. And the little babies were the sort of size. They are a blue color. See, I'm used to the African um, penguin, and they're big, and they're black and white, very plain. Here come these little blue penguins, tiny, shiny, and blue, blue eyes. And they live together in their families. Um, they are <clears throat> have this unique coloration, and they when they they do their their um, when they excrete their sparkle and their scatter, it sparkles because of what they eat, and it gives a blue tinge to it as well. They live most of their time in water, up to 18 hours every day. You only see them emerging from the water long after the sun is set, just as it's getting dark. They will come out of the water and sleep for a short time, and they're up and gone long before the sun rises. Um, they will eat up to their whole body weight in little fish, squid, uh, krill, uh, anchovies, sardines, anything that's small that they can consume. They make the most amazing noises. We went to a sanctuary where the ones that have been hurt or abandoned, they have a little sanctuary for the small penguins before they release them back into the sea. And these penguins make the most awesome sounds. They squeak, they squawk, they bark, they hiss, they cheep and they growl. You hear these sounds and you think, where's the dog? Oh, no, it's that, it's that little one over there. Then another one cheeps like a, like a little uh, chicken. And you're thinking, this is, this is like a bird and this is like a dog. And it, it's amazing. And they love making sounds. They talk to each other as they are playing. And they are very playful little creatures. They slide up and down and play in the water. They really do enjoy life. Um, they are serial monogamous, which means they stick to a partner for a full season. They don't go and mate with others during the breeding season. They, are, they stay with that partner. The next year, they may have the same partner or they may have a different one, but they, they will stay with one partner per breeding season. Um, very, um, the male throws his head back and he waves his flippers or in the air. And the one that waves the nicest, the female will choose as her partner for that particular breeding season. Then they do a little dance and the rest of the penguins stand around and they do this little patter patter dance. And there's a pattern to the dance that they do. It's very cute. Um, females lay one or two eggs at a time. And again, the male looks after them for about 37 days. He sits on that egg. He looks after that egg. And she goes off and she builds up enough fat and weight so that when the little ones come out, she can stay with the little ones. But as they go along, um, the father does come and forage at times and help mom out a little along the way. Uh, they take turns once the chicks are a little bit bigger than just tiny, probably a week or two, then they take turns to care for them. And after eight weeks, 
they abandon them. They say goodbye. They say, that's it. You're old enough now. Look after yourselves. And they return to the water until the next breeding season. So the little eight-week-olds, they stick together for a while and they eventually get down to the water and join the rest of the, the penguins. But some of them do find they can't quite get there. And those are the ones that are rescued, looked after until they are strong enough and big enough to go back into the water. Even though they're so tiny, they have 10,000 feathers on their body, which is quite amazing. Um, they preen with their own oils to keep them nice and shiny. And you've got this beautiful blue tinge to them as they walk around. And then finally, the, what they excrete is also shiny. And I think that's where the name that my, my opinion is that's where the name fairy penguin comes from because they have fairy dust that they excrete. So that is the, the last of our animals. Any question about the fairy penguin? Anybody seen a fairy penguin? All right. Well, thank you everyone for being in class. Um, I hope that you are all have learned a little about the lesser known animals in Australia tonight. And I, there are other series. There's the better known uh, animals in Australia and two series on the wild animals of Africa, where I come from. I lived in South Africa for 63 years and only moved to Australia three years ago. And so I grew up with the African animals and spent a lot of time amongst the animals. Right, I'm going to stop sharing. If anybody's got anything they would like to say or would like to do before we close the class. Right, thank you very much, everyone, for being part of the class today. Thank you, Tega. Glad to have you with us. And Charles, very, very nice to see you again in one of the classes. Lovely to have you all with us. Welcome, Melinda. You've just joined us. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Have an awesome day, every, uh, evening, everyone. Have a good day. Mark, bye for now. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.